Hello, Summoners, and welcome to another episode of Pro Guide's OP Picker Ban, now on patch 11.5. These are the champions that are a bit overtuned for one reason or another, so they have the power to affect your games more than they otherwise should. In light of that, you'll be wanting to either deny their existence altogether or secure them for your own team. So, hit that sub button and let's get into the video. Starting things off in the top lane, we have Darius who has not only been a dominant pick for months now, but also got some indirect buffs this patch with the changes to Stridebreaker and Black Cleaver. Since we have extensively talked about Darius in so many of our previous videos, we'll talk a bit about the item changes as well. Usually when Riot buffs or nerfs something that is already built by certain champs, they know to make preemptive compensation changes to said champs. That should especially be the case when we're talking about the most hated champ of top lane. So, as you probably know, Darius's one weakness is being kited. But with good players knowing you take Flash Ghost and the addition of Stridebreaker in Season 11, that weakness is all but gone as long as you play around your cooldowns. While the Stridebreaker change is listed as an adjustment, not a buff, that's not true for every champ. With its dash range being increased, the trade-off is a decrease to the slow and the damage it does. The thing is, if you're playing a champ who already has their own CC, the ability to actually reach your opponent means much more than the subsequent slow. We can easily see this in Darius's case. He chains his E and W on you after gap closing with Stridebreaker, so the nerf will be completely unnoticeable. While Darius does have great synergy with Deadman's Plate, movement speed being added to Cleaver means you now have the option of building into a more damage-heavy set of items before you start building defensively. So as always, you'll be a massive lane bully, winning out in both short bursty trades with your Q and the longer extended ones thanks to your passive, with your ult making you even scarier after level 6. Aside from being kited, Darius's only other weakness is being hard camped by a jungler to shut him down early. Since Darius can sometimes already turn a 1v2 on his own, if you can just communicate with your jungler to counter gank, you can easily turn the 2v2 into a win. Darius is one of the most frustrating champs to deal with, especially for newer top laners who don't have much experience against him. Just underestimating him once can lead to a death, and that usually snowballs into him picking up a kill every time his ghost is up. Even though they may still hate laning against him due to the validity of the lane, most more experienced top laners definitely have at least one pocket pick they can use to win the lane. And that brings us to today's question of the day. What's your pocket pick for dealing with OP champs? After the video, let us know how you counter at least one of the champs on the list down in the comments below. Now, let's talk about our next top laner. Before Nar got his last round of buffs, we predicted that he would, at the very least, become a viable pick in the meta. Since then, his performance has climbed up over the past few patches as players have gotten a grasp of how to play him again. And now, he's doing well enough to be put in our OP tier. On top of already doing well, like Darius, Nar will heavily benefit from the new item changes. The extra 100 range on Stridebreaker means having an easier time landing more impactful ults in teamfights, while Cleaver getting movement speed means even more chasing and kiting power in his mini form. You'll want to use your mini form to take short trades, looking to proc your grasp on your opponent every time it's up. If your opponent doesn't have a way to trade back very well, you can look for longer fights, proccing W to either kite them or chase them to punish them even harder. Just be careful that you don't get too excited and jump into your death with E. It can be easy to get carried away when bullying your laner and fall right into their waiting jungler's arms. To properly teamfight with Gnar, you'll have to learn to manage your rage so you can transform at the right time. You'll also really want to focus your fighting around having your summoners up. Since Gnar's engage is relatively telegraphed, the only way to reliably fight head-on without being disengaged is to look for an E-Flash ult combo. When Flash isn't up, you'll need to teleport to a ward behind your opponents to look for a flank. When you're playing a champ like Gnar, who has specific cooldowns and limitations to play around, one crucial skill is simply knowing when you can and can't take a fight. If you don't have your summoners and the opposing team already has control of the area, it's fine to give up a dragon, especially if it's the first or second one for their team. In those cases, just ping your team off the fight and look to shove in waves to trade back a tower instead. One thing to note with the build we gave, while that is the general build you'll want on Gnar, there are a couple of game-specific adjustments that can be made. If you're laning against a tank, you may want to opt for Divine Sunderer to help bully them harder. If your game calls for you to split to win, you'll want to swap out your second item. Sterax is a great anti-burst item for teamfights, but if you're split pushing, you won't need it, so opt for Blade of the Ruin King instead.
Next up, let's talk about some junglers. As you should already know, on 11.4, the jungle changes meant that junglers that could gank more would generally be more successful. Champs who strictly power farm camps and rely on their damage alone to carry in fights later, like Yi and Shivana, fell out of favor hard. So champs that pressure early, like Elise, Rek'Sai, and Lee Sin, all moved up in power. But the thing is, those champs are still just a bit inconsistent. If no lanes are gankable, it's pretty hard to ever get the ball rolling. And if you don't have a decent lead going into the mid game, you'll pretty much be useless on them. The best performing jungle champs are the ones that fall into the overlap of the two categories, with kits that allow them to quickly power farm their own jungle while also being able to gank early and snowball fast. Think of it like this. If both junglers are able to gank a lot and each end up with five kills by 10 minutes, but one has 40 CS while the other has been clearing their jungle and racked up 70 CS, there's a clear winner for who has more gold to work with to carry the game. So with all of that said, our first jungler is Hecarim. While he's maintaining his spot in the top tier, we'll be talking about a different build today. While Phase Rush is still a very good option on him, this Conqueror page is better for when you need more damage to carry fights. Also, stop taking Ignite on Hecarim. It's cheesy and it can help pick up early kills, but the resets on Ghost really enable your team fighting, giving you the movement speed you need to stick to your targets once your E is down. Our second pick in jungle is Udyr. In the past few seasons, Udyr's been a complete joke, being considered the most outdated champ in the game. Just compare him to some of League's newer releases. Having four different auto attacks to make up your entire kit just doesn't even seem like it should be in the same game as overloaded complex champs like Samira and Yone. But with some buffs to his R and the new items in Season 11, he's become one of the most contested champs in the game, even at a pro level. He has an insanely fast clear speed, able to consistently full clear his jungle and look to counter jungle anytime the chance is there. And despite not having a dash or jump, the burst of speed from his E allows you to easily punish opponents that push too far out in lane. And since it's a simple auto attack, your ganks are completely foolproof, turning that aforementioned overly simple kit into a strength. Early game, look to control the map and get small leads over the other jungler everywhere you can with Scuttlecrab and counter-jungling Raptors being two of the most consistent options for that. Just be careful about baiting your team into bad fights. While you can easily zoom out with your E and phase rush movement speed, if your teammate thought you were committing to a fight, you may just be leaving them to die. Be sure you use pings to communicate so this doesn't end up being the case. With Udyr being such an incredibly easy champ to play on a mechanical level, there's not really much in that department that separates players at the top of the ladder from everyone else. This means that the only real differences between them and you are the decisions made in game, like pathing, when and where to gank, and macro in the later stages of the game. And we're here to help with all of that and more. With a Pro Guide subscription, you get access to all of our courses, unlimited chats with our top tier coaches, and if you choose to book a session, you'll get a discounted rate. So whether you need to learn the basics or you wanna take things further with more advanced knowledge, head on over to ProGuides.com and check it out. And there's truly no better time than now to get on it since we're offering a huge deal. Just use discount code RANKUP2021 for 20% off your sub. Now, let's get back on topic, shall we? For the mid lane, we'll start off with Talon. His incredibly high early damage means you can often cheese your opponent for a free kill as soon as you hit level two if they disrespect you enough. And even if your opponent does respect your kill potential, you're still getting to play the game your way. Oftentimes, most players think respecting their matchup means sitting under turret and grabbing the farm they can. While this definitely keeps them from dying, when you're playing Talon, it means you get plenty of time to roam and look for kills. Good Talon players don't even wait for their ults. They'll look to roam as early as level three or four if they see an opportunity. It can be unexpected and incredibly tilting to get ganked by another laner so early, and is a really solid mental game to play against your foes, on top of putting both you and your teammates ahead in the game. Another thing that will tilt your opponents is just how hard it is to deal with you in the mid to late game. Talon's E is one of the most forgiving abilities in any champion's kit. With it, you can be completely caught out in the enemy jungle, but just jump wall after wall all the way to safety. As your opponents get more and more tilted, they may even try to send their whole team after you. Once you really feel comfortable on Talon, you can turn these situations into massive wins, using your ult and full comboing a squishy target for a kill, and 
then parkouring out of danger. And the whole time the enemy team is over-investing in you on this side of the map, your team is hopefully taking objectives elsewhere. The main reason Talon has risen in strength is due to previous item changes. When Bruisers dominated the meta, he was forced to jump on the Gore Drinker train with them. Since he couldn't one-shot the tankier targets, his best option was to join the Sustain War and pretty much copy their build. It was a case of, if you can't beat him, join him. But with all of those items taking heavy hits, he's once again able to opt for the one-shot lethality style we're used to seeing. One more thing to note is that if you're playing against shield comps, be sure to pick up the newly buffed Serpent's Fang somewhere in your kit. It may be super niche, but when it's strong, it's really strong. Our other OP mid laner is Viego. Though his win rate as a mid laner in Plat Plus sits just above 52%, you have to consider how much his mastery curve affects this. In most champs, mastery curve means playing that champ a lot and learning how to make the most of their abilities to carry. But Viego is a special case. While his base kit is extremely simple to use, his mastery curve is the highest in the game, since you technically know how to use every other champ in the game thanks to his passive. I've seen players pop off in a fight, bringing down enemy after enemy and taking them over to wipe the field. On the other hand, I've seen someone who's never touched Irelia before in his life possess her and then flash into a fight and do nothing and die, since he had no clue what he was doing. If you can handle piloting the different champs available to you, you'll easily carry the majority of your games. His lane phase is incredibly strong, having both fast pushing and super high sustain thanks to his Q. If your opponent ever oversteps, you can easily punish them with a quick burst of damage, even being able to 100 to 0 most immobile mid champs anytime after level 6. In teamfights, rushing head on into things will usually get you locked up and bursted down, especially early game when you don't have your more defensive items. Instead, use your E to lurk around fights, waiting until you can catch an opponent out. Once you do, just reset your way to victory. Moving things to the bot lane, we'll start off with Kai'Sa. Instead of the standard meta build that almost all players use, we'll be talking about a new one, aimed at carrying much harder in teamfights. The Hail of Blades page isn't necessarily bad, but you have to take a couple of things into account. Hail of Blades gives you most burst damage, but when it comes to extended fights or hitting multiple targets, PTA just wins out as the better keystone, especially when you consider the damage amp it gives to not just you, but your teammates as well. This is super useful for bringing down tankier frontliners. The next thing to talk about is Kraken Slayer over Gale Force. In my personal opinion, Gale Force has never been good on Kai'Sa, not even before it got nerfed. With her ult and E giving plenty of mobility and outplay potential, I just don't see why the mini dash would be worth more than the attack speed mythic passive and massive bonus damage to a champ that is supposed to be pumping out hyper carry DPS in teamfights. The last key difference in this build is swapping out the Collector for Phantom Dancer. The lethality from the Collector can definitely feel empowering early game, since it makes your Q hit so hard, but that's where its usefulness stops. Kai'Sa's other damaging abilities, her passive and W, do magic damage, so you're really only itemizing lethality for a single ability. Building Phantom Dancer's second gives you both your Q and E evolve, which means you can build into Infinity Edge next for a much stronger three item spike than the standard build. I hope you're willing to try out this new build and see how your games go. Personally, after I learned about it and gave it a try, I've never gone back. But hey, that's just how it feels to me. If you give it a go though, let us know how it goes in the comments down below. I'm a poet and didn't even know it. Our second pick for bot laners is Seraphine. As we've already touched on in our OP predictions video, taking away some damage from Seraphine's passive does practically nothing to her. Her passive isn't OP because it's some massive nuke. It's so strong because it allows her to constantly hit enemy champs from an incredibly safe distance, giving her a way to stay in combat and keep Moonstone fully stacked. And she's barely going to be affected by the change to her ult cooldown. Seraphine rarely tries to force fights early, so a 20 second increase to the cooldown on her ult doesn't really change what you'll be doing. On top of that, the late game cooldown is unaffected, and since your main goal as Seraphine is to make it to said late game fights, she's going to be just as good as before. The reason we list Seraphine as an OP ADC over the other two roles comes down to two things. Playing her as bot carry over support obviously means you'll be making more gold, and more gold means you'll reach those already cheap spikes even quicker. If you're playing a comp that wants to exclusively 5v5, being able to get all your teamfight essential items as fast as possible is pretty important. 
So what makes her better as an ADC compared to being played mid? Seraphine is mostly just there to soak up gold and scale up to team fights. She has decent trading in lane, but she's really not too reliable in the type of 2v2 fights that often happens with mid laners and junglers. Since ADCs usually don't have much impact early game anyways, putting Seraphine bot allows her to stick to the plan of farming up without putting a hamper on your jungler's early game plans. Now, rounding things off with our supports, we'll start off with Thresh. While most supports have super specialized kits excelling at a particular playstyle to win games, Thresh's kit is much more well-rounded, giving you options for every game. If you're in a hard winning lane, you can look to go aggressive, fishing for hooks or even flash flaying your opponents to try and pick up kills. If they're playing so respectful that they're willing to give up CS to stay safe, you can instead look for roams to help your mid laner or jungler. If you're in a tougher, more aggressive matchup, you can completely change your playstyle to a defensive one, using your flay to disengage the other bot lane to keep your ADC safe. This massive flexibility extends out of laning phase as well. In some games, your goal might be to be aggressive and look for picks, flashing for hooks and flays on enemy carries to catch them out in fights, while in other games, you may simply need to use all of your CC to peel, with your ult's massive slow helping to halt enemy dives and your E helping to even stop those divers with jumps like Lee Sin and Zack from reaching your backline. On top of all that disruption, Thresh also has one of the best get out of jail free cards in the game. With his lantern, he can save his teammates from otherwise impossible to escape from situations. This is a variety of uses. Sometimes you can do what's simply referred to as playing for lantern. This just means sitting all the way back at max lantern cast range from your ally, ready to cast lantern to pull them to safety. This is used when you think there's a very high chance that you're going to be ganked, but still want to let your ADC farm as they need. The more general use of lantern is to simply help a teammate reposition in a fight. Say for example, your carry is a jinx who is very fed, but her flash is going to be down for the dragon fight your team is about to take. If the enemy team has a champ like Jarvan who can flash ult her to keep her within a certain area, you want to be sure to play back and not waste your W cooldown beforehand. That way you'll be guaranteed to have it when she needs it. Finishing off our list, we have Leona. Before this patch, Shaco support was pretty much the sole reason you weren't always safe to blind pick engaged champs for support, since going in against a Shaco lane usually meant getting ping pong to death between boxes as the enemy ADC attacked you. But with Shaco support being hard nerfed this patch, engaged supports are becoming much better blind picks, and Leona is the best of them all. She pairs best with aggressive laners who want to play for kills, like Draven or Tristana, but honestly, she can be played with anyone, since her massive amounts of CC also allows her to frontline and peel for hyper carries. As with Thresh, if your opponents are playing overly defensive in lane, you can look to roam instead. One thing Leona has over other tanky supports is her massive engage range. Her ult's massive 1200 cast range means you can pick opponents from much further than other champs. Outside of lane phase, you should be using that massive range along with its low cooldown to constantly try to catch out opponents, either getting their flashes or even better, netting free kills at every chance you can. And that's another OP pick or ban 11.5 edition. Remember to let us know your pocket picks to counter some of these OP champs down in the comments below. And one last thing, check out our Discord in the description box below where you can enter our giveaway or just hang out and be a part of our community and make friends. Yay! That's it for the video. I can't wait to see you guys back for the next one. But until then, good luck on the rift. Stay safe, wash the hands, and sing with me. But don't sing a song that is popular. We don't want to get DMCA. <laughs>